So we're back with another episode of the Flex Work Podcast. Uh, today I have a really exciting guest on. It's one of my fraternity brothers who I haven't got a chance to catch up with in a while since uh, pre-COVID when we used to follow each other on social media and uh, see all our posts and, and everything yeah. else going on. So guys, it's my pleasure to introduce you guys to Kush Shah. Hey, going, how are man? you guys? Super excited to be here. And yeah, thank you so much for reaching out to me. Um, uh, this is my first podcast, so let's hope I don't mess it up. But yeah, very excited to be part of your uh, venture here. King Cobra, Poppin' Cherries. Hell yeah. All the time. <laughs> Dude, so uh, when did you graduate college? Uh, I graduated 2013. 2013. And mm-hmm. you've always been from Jersey. I have. Uh, or uh, actually, no, I was born in India. I grew up in Ohio and then Jersey. So Jersey has been, Plainsboro has been my hometown. West Windsor, Plainsboro. Yep. You're from around there too, I believe. Lawrenceville, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right around I, the corner. I ended up marrying a girl from West Windsor, Plainsboro. Uh, did you go to North or South? I went to North. <laughs> My wife went to North. Did she? When did she graduate? She graduated 2007. She's listening to this right now, and she's rolling her eyes. I'm <laughs> guessing 2007? 2007. Okay. I was 2009, so very little chance I might know her, but what's her name? Saranya Tana. Saranya Tana. It doesn't sound actually Indian. Is she Indian? or? I'm going to ask her when we get home. She, yeah, ask her if she knows no, me. Well, I know yeah. that she's not Indian. She's Sri Lankan. I know that ah. answer. <clears throat> but no, I'm going to ask her if she, if she ever remembers you. Yeah. But uh, cool. So we, you went to Rutgers. I went to Rutgers. And yep. then like, where did your career take yeah, you? Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually been an interesting path because I went to Rutgers and uh, nobody really grows up saying I want to be a real estate agent, right? That just doesn't happen. Like parents don't go around saying my son's going to be a real estate agent. Wait, what, what did you want to be when you grew up? Um, so I wanted kid. to be a doctor originally as instilled by all the parents out there. Um, however, at Rutgers, I changed that into finance and accounting. So that's what my path was supposed to be. Uh, I did accounting and economics at Rutgers, graduated um, with honors over there. Everything was great. Started my career at Deloitte. Worked Auntie, at uncle, he graduated with honors. He's good. Don't worry about him. That's all that matters. Um, yeah, uh, started uh, working at big companies such as Deloitte, Goldman Sachs, got my CPA, all that good stuff. Um, little did I ever think that one day I was going to trade it all in for becoming a realtor, but it's been the best decision I've ever made in my life. So Okay, so we talk me through that. Why, yeah. why did you make that jump? Were why? you just like... It's I a, hate calculators. I never want to see a calculator again. No, Screw because I actually protector. need the calculator right now okay. uh, in my real estate business. Um, so I, I was 22 years old when I bought my first investment property, um, and I absolutely loved it. Um, most people at 22 years old, they don't go out and say, hey, I want to buy an investment property. But I was just, uh, I don't know what the hell I was thinking, but I just wanted to do it. Um, uh, I feel really bad for whatever realtor I used at that time because I definitely, definitely had him show me a lot of houses. Um, and, uh, finally found one, uh, it wasn't all that expensive. So, uh, it was in New Brunswick, good old, uh, Brunswick. So, uh, bought the property there and absolutely loved it. Um, I loved being a landlord. I loved everything about the house. Uh, found out everything that could go wrong with the house as well at this property. I had the roof leak on me multiple times. I had a pipe freeze on me in the basement. Um, pretty much everything that you could imagine went wrong here, uh, failed township inspections. However, the tenants were perfect. So that was at least a silver lining. Um, beautiful family. Uh, they stayed there for a long, long time. Uh, everything was fantastic. But just that experience of owning that property made me now want to own more and more properties. And I thought, hey, what's the best way of owning more properties if I have access to seeing these houses myself? So that's the initial reason why I became a realtor. It's just so that way I could go out there, see a property and buy a property for myself to add to my rental portfolio. Um, little did I ever think that I was going to be helping other friends do it. Um, once I got my license, I actually had a friend uh, who actually is now a realtor. Um, he was looking for a house and he's like, hey, Kushal, uh, and I appreciate him so much because they took a stab at me. I had zero experience. And they're like, hey, do you want to help us buy a house? And I was like, sure. Um, and that was my first experience really working with other buyers and clients, right? I remember going to houses and there would be lock boxes there that I didn't know how to open. Like we would go there and uh, it, it's, it's an electronic lock. Yeah, yeah I know right? what they are. Yeah. So uh, I was a brand new agent. I was like, I was like, shit, I don't think I have access to open this. And these guys just drove half an hour, but these guys stuck by me. Um, we eventually figured things out. Uh, eventually um, found the right house for them. And I think that's when everything clicked for me. Just seeing when the right house is found by them, I can see it in their faces, right? It's, it's that look, it's that like, hey, this is the one. In the good old days of real estate, which was uh, pre-COVID, all, all we had to do now is negotiate. We had to just make sure we get it at the right price. Unfortunately, now I see that face way too often, like, hey, this is the right house. Now the problem is more so, it's the right house for the 20 other people that also want it. So it's a different ball game now. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, bec- uh, becoming a realtor has been definitely awesome. I like seeing houses, it's been fun. And uh, the way I would explain it is, 
So no two transactions are ever the same, but the end result always is, right? It's a smile on people's faces. People like to be happy when they're purchasing their house, whether it's when they find the house or whether it's on the day of closing. And just for me to be there on that small little bit of happiness for them, that's why I like being a realtor. Um, and yeah, everything about real estate pretty much teaches me more about the next transaction. Every inspection that I go to, uh, I learn something new because the inspector will tell me like, hey, this is wrong with this house because of X, Y, and Z. And now I can take that little bit of knowledge and share that to my next buyer before we even get to that inspection stage. So it's a, it's a growing learning experience. And I like that it's a different day. Um, it's not a typical nine to five. It's actually nothing but a not to nine to five because um, it's all evening hours. It's all weekends. So in the beginning, I was transitioning both working full time at these big companies such as Deloitte, Goldman Sachs, ACT Commodities, a hedge fund in the energy trading fund, uh, world. Uh, and then eventually I just went full time into real estate. But yeah, it's been good. Dude, it's so exciting to hear that you love what you do. Yeah, it's a, it's it's. A, I go to family parties now, and before yeah. everyone's like, "Hey, uh, how how is it being uh, an accounting? Like, how's how's the CPA? It's tax season." I was like, "Yeah, it's it is what it is." Now it's uh, I go to these family parties, and everyone's like, "Hey, how's the market?" And I was like, "Yeah, it is what it is, because it really is." Yeah. Um, the markets uh, markets taken off. Markets crazy right now, but I absolutely love what I do. I like talking to people about it. Right. Um, I, I, at this point, I still remember going, or let me take it back a few years, right? I remember going to family parties and my parents would say, oh, my son works at Goldman Sachs or my son works at X and Y Z company. My son is a CPA. My son is a controller of a company and controllers are pretty My high. son works at AKG Creative. Right. That's, that's, the whole thing. that's actually very impressive too. That is impressive. Not just the two part, but that is impressive. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's one of those things where my parents were proud that I worked at these big companies at a low, at a role such as controller, right? Which is a pretty high position right below the CFO. But now it's different because now when I go to family parties, my parents say, my son is a realtor. He's really good at what he does. If you're looking to buy or sell a house, use him. And this is awesome because I actually helped my parents sell their house last year, helped my parents buy their house. Um, and it's uh, I've always seen this expression of joy on other people when they're buying and selling, but it's never been to my parents. And it was awesome actually seeing that in person. So my mom wasn't that thrilled when we sold because she didn't really want to leave. But all in all, I think uh, she was happy with the amount that we were able to get her. So yep. Mama Shaw knew she was going to have to do all the packing. Yeah, the she was packing. not with it. She yeah. uh, she told me she wanted to die in that house in Plainsboro, and she's like, this is my house. So where do they live now? So they're in Somerset now. Uh, we just had a baby. He's 17 months old. Uh, we moved to Branchburg, so my parents wanted to be a little bit closer to us. Um, Plainsboro to Branchburg isn't that far. It's 45 minutes or so, but uh, my dad wanted to be very close to the temple, so... Somerset was like the perfect ideal location. It's close to us and it's close to the temple. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's lower taxes than Plainsboro and you get a lot bigger house. So Plainsboro is definitely great for the school district, but now that me and my sisters are out, it didn't really make sense for them to stay in Plainsboro. So you've never been on a podcast before. I've never been on a podcast, no. What, what was the limiting factor here? I, no one's ever invited me, yeah, so no thank ever, you. Yo, realtors need to be yeah, shouted is, out a This has been more. awesome, yeah, no, it's... Uh, and I haven't even bought a house from you yet. No, well, right? we will be soon, and not just one. It's going to be multiple. Oh, multiple? Because I can, I can actually feel it. You're definitely going to buy your own house, but you're the type of person that I don't think stops at just like doing something for yourself, right? You're a hustler. You're going to go out there and you're going to buy multiple properties, so it's not just a one-off transaction. And That's pretty much how I live my real estate world. Um, I don't view every transaction as like, hey, I'm helping this buyer or seller buy this house and then bye bye, it's done. No, it's about following up with them. It's about reaching out to them after the sale. It's about reaching out to them six months later. Hey, how's it going, right? Because it's that constant relationship that's actually going to help me get the next lead that I'm going to get. All right, let's tell everyone at home the truth. How many homes do you own? I own, uh, I'd say four and a, uh, and a third. And the third is... How, does, how is there a third of it's, a house? It's because I, uh, I own one house in partnership with three people. So four and a third. So you can actually buy a house with like your friends. Correct. Yeah. It's, uh, so this house was actually insane. Um, uh, I bought it right when COVID first hit, right? So it was on auction.com. It was a house in Willingboro. I don't know if you know the area. It's uh, South Jersey. The house was dirt cheap. It was uh, $85,000. And it needed substantial amount of work per the photos on the um, uh, on auction.com. However, I had the pleasure of being a realtor, actually going and seeing this house in person. And it looked nothing like the photos. The bank somehow came in, renovated this whole entire house, but they never updated the damn photos on auction.com. Oh, man. Yeah. So I, this was, a, it was it was an awesome opportunity. So uh, I put a bid. I won the auction because um, everybody else is looking at it They're like, hey, the numbers don't work for this piece of crap. At eighty-five thousand, it needs another thirty-five thousand dollars worth of work. Numbers don't work. It wasn't a super high-end area, so that's what the house prices were. Um, anyhow, I won the house at eighty-five thousand dollars, but COVID just hits, right? So 
there's a lot of uncertainty in what's going to happen. So at this point, it's like, shit, do I continue with this purchase or do I back out? Um, and I'm talking about this is like March 2020, um, April 2020, right? So we didn't know that the housing market was going to go completely cahoots and completely go up. Um, so I decided to stick with it, but I was like, you know what? Let me actually bring in a few friends so that way I'm, uh, it, uh, uh, I'm not taking the risk on fully, right? So I brought in these two other friends uh, from my high school, great guys. So we, we go in together. They all knew the risk of like, hey, the market might go down. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. How does that work? So you, you're the one who signs the title. Correct. Right? And the mortgage. I, I'm assuming you didn't buy cash. No. So that's a uh, fantastic thing on this house is they actually allowed financing. So I just won the auction.com bid, but nothing had closed, right? So we were still in that process before closing. So I was able to bring in two additional buyers. We were able to modify the contract to add in that two other buyers are buying this. So all three of you guys All signed. three of us signed. Uh, uh, exactly. We signed the deed together. We got a mortgage together. So all three of our names are on this but, property. But is that the normal way that people will buy a it's house with friends? Not really. Most people, if they do it, they buy it cash because um, it's a lot easier. People buy houses with friends all the time, especially investment properties, but it's primarily cash. Doing it through a mortgage definitely makes it a little bit more tricky because now the mortgage lender is not just verifying one person's information, they're verifying all three people's information. But I think what made it easy was that the purchase price was so low on this house and then all three of us were more than well qualified to buy this house individually that the lender didn't really have a problem in verifying uh, the, any information. So it was a pretty smooth process. We got the house and we spent about $5,000 on like basic updates. Um, and then our plan was just to flip it, right? We're gonna sell it at 150,000. We put it on the market, maybe it was 165,000. I forget the exact number. Um, we put it on the market and we started getting offers, but the offers we got were, they were pretty good offers. However, they started dinging us for like, hey, your HVAC is old, your hot water heater is old. We want a $15,000 credit. We want a $20,000 credit. Because what happened is they just discovered the price we bought it at and they, they realized we did absolutely nothing to the house. And when buyers are in that mindset, they start wanting to, uh, they're like, hey, why are they? Why are these guys making 50, 60K in a span of two weeks or in a span of a month? Uh, I was okay with it. I was like, hey, let's just sell it. But luckily, this is why having partners is awesome. These two other guys are like, hey, no, you know what? Let's just rent it out. And I was like, uh, I don't know if we should rent it out. This is just quick money. This is easy money. Let's just sell it. Uh, I was outvoted and I'm so glad I was. We ended up renting out the house at an amazing price and now we still own this house, and the beautiful part is the house is now worth like three sixty five. And three sixty five. Three sixty five. Yeah, just based on uh, COVID and the inflation. So you're essentially four x. Yeah, it's well divided by three because I own it, own one. I mean, but you're, whatever you put in, you still four x. Exactly. Yeah. Right? Yep. Wow. Man. Yeah, it was a. It, but uh, and this is why I, I always tell myself like, hey, I should have done this house by myself, so therefore I could have made all that yeah. money. But if I had done that, I would have sold the house for one forty k after the credits I would have given, right? Made so a quick 40, 50K, and that's it. Why didn't I get a phone call? You will on the next one. Okay. All right. <laughs> just, I, I don't, don't think it'll be at 85000 though. Uh, <laughs> baby, if you're listening, I'm just saying if there's an $85,000 on a purchase on the credit card or whatever <laughs> it is, don't be surprised. On probably the credit card. Fault. <laughs> okay, so four and a third homes that you own, and the, the other four, do you live in any of them? Or are they all like I do. investments? I do. So, um, Does your, uh, do your parents live in one? Do her parents live in no, one? Like, how does all that work? Uh, they're all investments. Um, I live in one of them. I lived in one in Hoboken, so that was our uh, our condo that we owned in Hoboken. But after having the baby, we realized that 660 square feet is not enough. So we How much is enough? It, I, I'd say there's really no right answer to that, just enough for for the baby to run around in, right? That's the right answer. How much room does a baby need? It's a a 17-month-old baby. You'd be surprised. He's, uh, we actually put him in a little cage at the Hoboken spot, and he hated it. I have photos of him, like, holding on to the baby gates, like, saying, let me out. Like, um, can I wait to get to show him those photos when he's, like, 18? Oh, yeah. He's going to love it. That's that's awesome. Yeah. But, um, no, we have, uh, our house is, is modest. It's, uh, like, 2,400 square feet, so nothing huge, but it's, it's a layout that matters, right? It's a single-family um, uh, in Hoboken, it was a condo. So what that meant is the parents had a very hard time coming to visit us because parking was miserable. Getting yeah. to Hoboken was miserable. Um, and then but the if pizza's you got, good. Pizza's delicious. And the yeah. Italian food is you know, even better. But yeah, just there wasn't much space there. Hoboken was fantastic, especially in the summer to take him on walks. Uh, the park's there. And it's like you're walking and you're literally just seeing a, a, a sea full of kids, right, and parents. So it was a good place to definitely be in the summer. But in the wintertime, we knew we were going to get screwed because this guy had, has way too much energy. He needs space to run. So we bought our single family house um, and then we rented, uh, ended up renting out the Hoboken condo. So uh, I didn't want to sell it just because our rate was like 2.5 or 2.75. And 
I was just like, I don't want to lose that rate. I was like, this rate is too good to lose. So I'm hoping rates go down to that amount, but I don't, I don't see that happening. Well, let me ask you this question. Mm -hmm. uh, first podcast that you're on, but you've probably seen real estate podcasts and like, you know, just non real estate people talking about real estate, yeah. like these bigger pockets, podcasts yep. and exactly. all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. What makes you love a podcast that's about real estate versus what makes you hate a podcast that's about real estate? Hmm. That is a good question. I know that's, I ask the best questions. Yeah. And that's a tough one, too, because I got to answer both parts. Um, I'd say the part I like about real estate podcasts is that I can connect with it, right? Um, whenever they have an investor, whenever they have like, hey, w what could go wrong with this rental property and you're listening to them talk, I can actually physically and mentally connect with like, oh, yeah, that's actually happened to me. I see exactly what you mean. So that's the best part about it, but that's also the worst part because I can see the bullshit that they're saying just to feed it to the people, right? Because like, that's never going to happen in practice. But I know why they're saying it. They're saying it because the average person out there that has no real estate experience, they're falling for it, so. So what's like the most common BS that we're hearing on these like real estate podcasts? Uh, I'd say the most common BS is like, oh yeah, you can go out there and buy a house for like nothing. And like 5K, FSA yeah. loan, all that kind of, FHA? FH, you, yeah, and then the other is. other one is like, oh, you can actually assume the seller's mortgage and- uh, Oh, like seller financing? Yeah, you can get their 2.5% rate. And I was like, realistically, you could, but in practice, theoretically, it just it's not, or sorry, other way around. Theoretically, you could, but in reality, it's not possible. Maybe in Ohio, but not in uh, Jersey. Yeah, I, I don't even know about Ohio, but definitely not in Jersey. It's why when a seller puts his house on the market, and let's assume he has a two point five percent interest rate, and let's say you make an offer saying, "Hey, I'm going to buy your mortgage. I'm going to take it over at two point five percent," and they have four other offers of people that are making clean offers saying, "Like, hey, I'm just going to buy your house at whatever the market rate is." You're telling the seller to go through the hoops and hurdles of calling their lender to see if the lender will allow them to do this. On top of that, you need to match everything exactly the way that they have it. Whatever their equity is, you need to pay them out. So you need a shit ton of cash on, on the top. It's just not possible. And on top of that, most conventional loans are not actually assumable. So then it's like, oh, see if it's an FHA loan. I was like, it's not, sorry. <laughs> My favorite nonsense that I hear on these podcasts are like the fastest way to make a million dollars Buy a home for a million, sell it for two million. Hmm. And I'm that's just like, genius. okay, great. That's <laughs> such great advice. So much entertainment here. Of course, that's how it all works out for all of us, <laughs> right? And I, I think the real estate podcast that I love list talking about and, and understanding is when people talk about this is what to look for in an MLS listing. Like this is what to look for when you get to the house. And this is how to understand the way to negotiate. Yep. I remember growing up, and you probably remember this, right? When you had a resume... I mean, just what you don't know, you don't know. And like, you, did you know that you could renegotiate with the company that's giving you an offer for, for like a job or anything like that? You just didn't know that until you were older in life. That's very true, yeah. And your so first like, job, second job, you probably don't know until your third job you figure it out. And I promise you, like if you're applying for a job, I mean, don't do this to me, whoever's applying to work at AKG. But <laughs> if you come back with like, I want 10% more, they're just going to say yes, right? They're giving you an offer based on... The way it was originally you. put out and everything else, but the process of vetting someone and like going against like 30, 40 other candidates, like you have an opportunity to negotiate. But on the same note, when you're trying to buy a house, like you don't know what you don't know. Like they don't teach you this stuff growing yeah. up in high school or in college or anything like that. So the things that you can actually negotiate on and how to go about it, there's been some great podcasts that I found that actually go into like the detail of like the different topics they bring up. I think you and I were just like talking about some stuff before the podcast started and you were telling me about um, like negotiating uh, like something with like a heating pipe or like, uh, like a heater or an HVAC being old or whatever, right? And like those are things that you can actually say I want a discount on when yep. you make the offer and the thing. But like most people just don't know that kind of stuff. So, I mean, I want to put you on the spot. What are like three things that people can negotiate when they're trying to buy a house? Yeah, that's a, that's a great, uh, great question. So people can actually negotiate on many, many things, right? Um, the main thing you want to make sure is you have a real estate agent that you trust that's working in your best interest. If your real estate agent just views you as a transaction, their job is just to make sure you get to that house and that's it. Um, but you want an agent that's actually going to go out there and fight for you, right? You need to scare the other side that your buyer is going to be walking away and that's how you get a negotiation. Um, that's the same thing. If you're applying for a company and they know you're going to take the job at the 10% less salary, they're not going to give you the 10% more, right? So the goal here is to make them believe that you're not going to take at, take it at 10% less. And that same motto goes in real estate. Um, so that being said, some of the things you can negotiate on are obviously the age of the appliances. This one is a little tricky because 
in the beginning of every real estate contract, they put a clause in there saying that as long as it's working, you can't really negotiate it. So it's a, it's a bit of a fine line, but if you play your cards right, it's something that can be done. So when we say appliances, do we mean like HVAC the, the, systems? Exactly, the major appliances. If the dishwasher is old, you're not really going to get much for that. It's a, That's a $700 repair. But yeah, we're talking about the big stuff out there. Okay. Um, so the big stuff are like HVAC. Um, exactly. HVAC, hot water heater, AC, that kind of stuff. Roof is a good one. Um, and roof is actually a fantastic one. So you want to make sure your, your real estate agent is advising you to use the right inspector. And that right inspector needs to have a drone, right? There's a lot of inspectors out there in New Jersey that don't use drones because it's not required. Yeah. Okay. I, I learned this the hard time, uh, the hard way because I have buyers that are like, hey, I know my inspector. He's going to come out. I'm like, fantastic. I was like, I'll get, I'll get to meet a new inspector. This guy comes out there, this Joe Schmo. And you know how he checks the roof? He goes to the other side of the street, puts his hand to his head here. And he's like, yeah, roof looks pretty good. And I'm like, you guys should have used my inspector. My inspector uses the drone, right? With the drone, you find everything from the chimney lining to the any missing shingles. The bird's nest or whatever yeah, else. Yeah, and this is beautiful there. because the sellers themselves don't know the condition of their roof, right? Because little, even if you put a new roof on the year before, any rainstorms that have happened, shingles could have flown off and you won't know. The inside could be beautiful, but the outside, you don't really know what it is until you get the drone up there. So the roof is a good one to negotiate. Um, the structural issues are always good. Uh, and then the other big one is the sewer uh, line. So a lot of people actually don't do a sewer inspection, but if you're buying a house that's 40, 50 years old, highly, highly recommend to do a sewer inspection. Um, what that is, is actually a very dirty inspection, but it's very needed. They're literally opening up the sewer pipe, sticking a camera in there, going all the way to the street to make sure that there's no clogs, to make sure there's no root penetration. And if, let's say you don't do this inspection and let's say you have a backup and something is wrong, that expense falls on you and that could be ten to twenty thousand dollars right there because they have to dig wow. everything up so if you have pavers outside if you have a sidewalk if you have a driveway everything has to get ripped up new pipe has to get installed it's a it's a very messy pro uh, messy process that's intense yeah it's so, a i guess i mean if you're interested in a property What's the likelihood that they're going to let you do all those tests and those inspections? So that's that's the tricky part. You're not supposed to tell them like I'm going to do all of these tests before you get the house before you get the offer accepted. You go in there telling them, "Hey, I want to buy this house. We're going to do limited inspections," which is standard language now, right? Everyone says limited inspections, but of course, as a buyer, you want to do your due diligence. So as a realtor, what I would advise them on is like, "Hey guys, this house is a little bit on the older side. I would highly recommend you spend that extra 150 bucks to get that sewer scope done, right?" Um, and sometimes it's clean and sometimes it's a waste of $150, but that peace of mind is so worth it. Um, and same thing with an oil tank sweep. Uh, you want to sweep the land that you're buying the house on to make sure there's no buried oil tanks. Because if you buy a house with a buried oil tank, it's now your responsibility on getting it out. And if there's any soil contamination, that's tens of thousands of dollars of damage right there. The EPA has to get involved. It's, uh, it's super messy. So that's another good inspection to add in. Um, and most inspectors are pretty good because uh, if you do all of these uh, a la carte, it's going to cost you a decent amount of money. But a lot of the, the home inspectors, what they'll do is they'll group it in all together to give you a nice little package. Dude, I, I didn't even know that sewer inspection was a thing. Yeah, it's but a... It just goes back to what you don't know, you don't know. Right? Exactly. Like, you don't even know what questions to ask. You don't know how to negotiate yeah. that kind of stuff. All right, so let's talk through how do you immediately identify a bad real estate agent? Ooh. That's a good one. Um, so for me, it's a little bit different. I know when I'm speaking to another real estate agent that he or she's going to be a nightmare to work with just in the way that they're talking, right? I've had agents talk, tell me on the phone, like, I've done this for 30 years and you don't know what you're doing. And I was like, well, clearly you don't know something because we're getting this deal accepted and we're doing it this way and it's going to happen this way. Um, so that's definitely a negative. Um, when they also don't really give you any customized or personalized attention, a lot of times realtors, what they do is they're like, hey, Uncle, you want to buy a house? Fantastic. What are your criteria? Awesome. I'm going to set up a search on you on the MLS. It's going to start emailing you a bunch of houses. If you see anything that you like, let me know. You see something you like and you say, hey, can we go take a look at this? Then they say, hey, yeah, there's an open house on Saturday, one to three. Go take a look at it. That's how you know that real estate agent does not really care about you or your transaction or your needs, right? Um, for me, it's not about just have, having you find a house. It's about, hey, uncle, why do you need a house? And oftentimes I'm telling my buyers like, hey, are you guys sure you need a house this big? And of course it's not my place to say anything like that, but I just want them to think outside the box, right? Oh or, my God, or I can't wait till you get to talk to my wife. 
And you're like, are you sure you need a house this big? Oh, I can't wait oh, to I can't see wait. your reaction. Yeah, it's because I, I just want I just want to lay out the possibilities, right? I have I have buyers that will send me a house that's on a main road, and they're like, hey, this house looks fantastic. It's at a great great price point, and I'll have agents that'll go out there and show them the house, and the agents like, oh yeah, because we're taught in real estate school that if the buyer likes the house, you as the agent should like the house, right? So that means that if you and I go into a house together, and you're like, oh my gosh, this house is awesome. My answer should be like, yes, it is awesome. That's how we're trained in real estate school. But no, I operate differently. I'm more so like, hey, uncle, yeah, this house is awesome, but did you look at the surrounding area? You have a main road right over there, an intersection right over there. Do you really wanna live in a place like this? And that makes you think, oh yeah, you're right. Now the price makes sense. But a lot of agents out there don't do that second part because all they see you as a, as a transaction. Once they're done with you, they now get to move on to their next buyer. So they don't wanna show you 20 houses. They'd rather show 20 buyers one house and each house gets selected. So that's, right. I think, the biggest distinction. distinction we got to role play then. Yeah. Let, let's show everyone at home what, what types of questions you ask a potential homeowner. For or, sure. Or so. a person going into the market to buy a home. For sure. So let's actually do this with exactly you. So yeah, I yeah. know you're going to be on the market very, very soon. So what makes you want to buy a house? Because I know you just renewed your lease. I uh, just got married. That's and, a good reason. Uh, we're in a we're in a one bedroom plus dan apartment, and it's just not. We're gonna outgrow it soon. Yeah, especially and, if you plan on growing the family. And I think what I know is that my lease ends next December, and so I don't know when the right time to start looking is. But I do know that I shouldn't wait to like November, of, of you know this year to be like, oh, it's time to find the yeah. house and what we're gonna do next. That's very true. So I I get that question a lot. When when is the right time to buy, right? And the answer is there's really no set right time to buy because it really depends on you and your situation. So in your case, if your lease is ending in December, you're absolutely correct. You cannot wait until November or October. And especially in this market, because what you've seen on the news is actually correct. People don't go out there and get a house tomorrow. You're going to go out there, find the house of your dreams, love it, make an offer, and it's not going to get accepted, right? right. That's just a reality. It's, it's Don't a tell sad, my wife that, though. It's a sad reality, It's but unfortunately, that's that's what happens, right? So we're seeing cases where buyers are making an offer and not getting accepted. Next week, they're out on the market again, finding another house. Once again, the same thing happens. Um, so you want to really make sure you're working with the agent that has the experience for this particular market. Because um, honestly, it is a lot about connections. It's about, um, uh, actually, here's a funny story. One of the things that I used to do last year when it was a little bit slow is I used to visit open houses, right, of agents that I knew have that have a lot of listings just to get to know them. Just be like, hey, I'm Kushal Shah from Remax and Style Realty. And then they would be like, hey, nice to meet you. So now next year when I make an offer on their house, they know who I am. They've met me in person. That little bit of connection sets you apart, especially when you have five to ten other offers you're going up against. Um, but yeah, it's a, so, so in your case, I would say the right time to start looking would probably be summer ish just to have an eye open just cause you never know when you're going to find a house. Um, and let's say you find the house of your dream in July, right? And now you're like, Hey shit, what do I do? I'm going to have to double pay rent. That's a situation we come across all the time. And the options are, you can either sublet, you can maybe offer the seller a use and occupancy, which is actually becoming super popular nowadays. What that means is you would close on the house in July or August, but you would say, hey, seller, do you want to actually rent it back from me for a little bit? And a lot of times sellers do want that because they don't know where they're going or they need the funds from the house that they're selling to buy something else. So that's exactly what I did on my house. Um, I bought my house in August, but we didn't move in there until I think October because the sellers wanted an extra month and a half of living there and that worked out perfectly. We didn't want to leave Hoboken in the summer, so I was like, this is perfect. I'll buy the house in August. You guys rent back from me. That's what a use and occupancy is until uh, I think mid September. Then we did some renovations when we moved in October. Okay. Well, outside of the time of which, uh, you know, I got to get out of this apartment and find where we're going to go next, uh, the idea of more space seems nice because apparently 660 square feet isn't enough. No, not at all. Uh, yeah. And then I think the other idea is I'm a very hands-on person, right? Uh, God bless my mother. She worked at Home Depot for 30 plus years of her career. So I went to like every single Home Depot uh, like training thing that you could put the kids in, right? Building the bird home oh, or yep, yep. whatever else. I hope you still have the discount. Oh, uh, I mean the five oh, finger discount? No, 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 not the five finger discount. But <laughs> uh, the, the secret open box discount? Yeah, yeah, that's always there. <laughs> but I think the, the reality is that 
I've always liked to customize things, and mm. like you can't do that in apartments. Yeah. Like for something as simple as like turning everything to be smart, right? The lights, the switches, like motion sensor kind yeah. of stuff. But you can't really do that in apartments. I mean, I, I've done some stuff here and there that like makes my life easier. Yeah. But I would really like to expand upon that kind of stuff. Yeah, and that's actually a great reason for buying a home, right? Because you get to do with with it what you want, and it actually builds equity from you for you. Um, if you're renting from someone, yeah, you can go ahead and uh, upgrade their electrical outlets and all that, but what value does it actually add to you other than the use that you get from it? Um, in terms of equity, there is none, right? So buying a home, you definitely get equity, you get to customize it how you want, and you get to make it for you. So um, obviously the timing is super key for you when you wanna buy the house. Then the next part is why you need the house, right? So if it's like, hey, I need a house with a yard because I have a dog, or hey, I need a house with two living rooms, uh, a living room and a family room because we're expecting or because the family's growing or because we want a separate area. So next thing is setting parameters for your search, right? What are you looking for? Um, and I would say a great starting place for any buyer is to visit open houses. Even if you're not in the market for a house right now, but there's an open house around the corner from you, go take a look at it. Cause you're not really gonna know what you like and what you don't like in a house until you actually go and see it. I've had so many buyers that'll go to an open house and they're like, oh wow, I always wanted a two story foyer, but now I'm okay with it doesn't have one cause I fell in love with this house, right? So it really opens your eye up to what you like and what you don't like or what you might be okay with and what you might not. Um, some people are like, hey, I absolutely need this and that's okay, that's, that's their choice. That's, that's what we're gonna look for. Um, and then the next part of the search comes the search, right? This is the part where it gets a little tricky because right now you have very limited listings, um, very limited inventory out there. So uh, unfortunately in this market, buyers oftentimes have to compromise, which isn't ideal, right? But our goal is to find you what works for you um, at the budget that works for you. We go out there, find a house, and you're like, hey, I love this house, let's make an offer. Now that's another challenge because in this market, you're not the only one that likes the house. Chances are in a market with limited inventory, there's two encores, there's three encores out there that want that same exact house. And every encore is equally as qualified. So what sets you apart? Obviously the price is one, right? You can tweak the price, but there's so many other things you can do to the offer that if you have an agent that is experienced in this market, they'll be able to actually get your offer accepted because there's things out there, nuances that even the other side hasn't heard of until you present it to them. Um, and just to go back on your point of negotiation, so a really nice and smart strategy, especially on new construction, is new construction communities, they don't like negotiating on the price. And the reason why is because it sets a lower base for everyone else around them, right? So if they sell you one unit at a lower price, how is it fair to the other 10 people that have just bought something at the market price? And it also sets a lower base for them for the next person, because they're gonna be like, hey, this house just sold at this price. So the way to negotiate with new construction is like, hey, I'll leave the price at this amount, but you pay 10 months of my HOA, you pay 12 months of my HOA, because things like that are hidden, right? So that never gets disclosed publicly. Publicly, your sale goes down at one to X price, but they don't know what package you got, right? You say, hey, throw in two years of free parking, right? Especially if it's a new construction in Hoboken or Jersey City. That's a popular one, but a lot of times agents don't know that. They don't know that you can negotiate. They try on the price and the answer is 99% no, because new construction doesn't negotiate on the price. So it's what else can you do to actually have your offer accepted? That makes so much sense. Yeah. I guess I always thought that new construction was just like, this is what it is, and you can just customize the home however you're going to customize it. And then I, I quickly learned when I was younger, when my parents bought a home, that I mean, you could customize it like crazy, but it doesn't make any sense to do all that because you know, that's what the property is not valued at versus you just getting at the cookie cutter version of the house and yep. taking your time to customize it over the next five, 10 years, however you want to. I, I mean, do you run into that situation often where like one of the buyers are like, oh, I want like the $100,000 granite and I want this and I want that and so on and so forth. And then now all of a sudden, well, your taxes are now 150 grand a year. Like this is what you ended up with with after all your additions. Yeah, it happens all the time. Um, uh, some new construction companies, what they do is they give you the option to customize the finishes, right? So you can change the flooring, you can change whether you want hardwood floors on the second floor, um, and all of this is at a premium. I also invest in houses, so I flip houses, so I know how much things should cost, and I know the price that they're giving these buyers, they're ridiculous, but a lot of buyers still choose to go with it, and the reason why is the peace of mind. People that are buying new construction typically are not in the mindset of, hey, I'm gonna buy this house and then I'm gonna renovate it further myself, right? So it's a lot, a lot of it is peace of mind and ease of transaction. 
Um, and it's a different type of buyer that wants new construction. It's typically somebody that wants something that's move and ready. So I do see buyers sometimes paying a premium just for getting the flooring upgraded, right? You might pay $10,000 where it should have actually cost you $5,000. But to them, that difference is nominal because they actually get to move in with that new flooring on day one. Um, so every, every buyer is different. Um, now, actually, what a lot of new construction companies have started doing is they've kept everything very cookie cutter, saying you can't really customize much other than maybe the color of your cabinets. Um, and the reason why they do this is because they order everything in bulk. So that's why the prices are also cheaper, because if they allow you the option of customization, now the prices, because they don't know how much inventory they have to order, they don't know what exactly you want. Um, so now a lot of the companies, they pretty much say like, hey, this is what we're going to give you. You can maybe choose whether you want white cabinets or brown cabinets, or if you want light color floors or dark color floors, but you don't really get too much uh, uh, customization anymore. So let's talk about construction of homes mm -hmm. and the things that we're seeing popular in like the Midwest, and like other areas, like yep. the prefab homes and the barn dominiums and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, all the HGTV stuff. Yeah, is that coming to Jersey? It's, it's not. You might go on Zillow and you might find these listings and it's like, hey, I can get this brand new construction house for $600,000 in Joe Schmo, New Jersey. Um, and then you look further into it and it's like, there's really no foundation. It's uh, they're, they're taking a tent and putting it on a piece of land and selling it to you. Uh, I, uh, I've never been into one of those houses, but I don't really know if it can withstand our Jersey winters. But uh, I, I know I've seen it. I just don't know if it's actually selling. But, uh, so I mean, I think I told you I lived in Pittsburgh for like a, yeah. little, like a minute, right? Yeah. And uh, I remember there was these, there was this one house that was just significantly more beautiful than everything else around it, and it was a house that like Jason Momoa was staying in for mm -hmm. when they was filming like or whatever it was, and just oh, happened wow. to be uh, the company I was working for is good friends' home that they owned, and I didn't realize that when you buy the plot of land or you're doing a, a re you know construction from the ground up or whatever that you could hire an architect to make it however you want to, right? And then present it to the county to get your permits or mm -hmm. whatever it is. And I, I just, that was another one of those things where I just didn't know that was even an option. I always thought when you do a ground ground up construction job because you own a pot of land or whatever it's going to be, that's got to look like everything else in that community. No, no, that's actually a great point. It, 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 so it really depends on where your lot of land is located. If it's located within a community, within a development, then they definitely have their rules and regulation. But nine out of 10 times, it's not. If you're buying a lot of land out there, you can make it whatever the hell you want to make it. Um, of course, the township just has to approve it. So if you say you want um, four full bathrooms on the first floor, the township most likely will say no. Uh, townships get super particular about um, first floor full bathrooms and bath full bathrooms in the basement. Why is that? Um, they just view it as, so first floor, I don't really understand, but the basement, they view it as you're going to try renting it out. So that's why they, uh, they don't allow the basement full bathrooms. Um, but yeah, as long as you get township permissions, uh, you'll be okay. So we actually bought a house in Cherry Hill, me and my partner. Wait, wait, wait a second, wait a second. You're saying the township could say no? The township so the can 100% say no. Yeah, it, and it really depends on townships. Um, I had a buyer buy a house in Clifton, and he's trying to do a full bathroom in the basement, and the township's giving him a very hard time. It was funny because the full bathroom actually existed before he bought the house, but the seller had to dismantle it in order to sell it because the township wouldn't have passed the inspections. So that happens all the time where people do things without the township knowing. Because technically, if the township doesn't come in there, who knows, right? Yeah. But um, yeah, townships can say no all the time. And especially in areas where they think that you're going to try renting out parts of the house, they're definitely going to say no. So I've been in homes in this North Jersey area mm -hmm. where you go down to an unfinished basement and there's just like a toilet yep. in the basement. Yeah. But there's no walls. No, that's like, a good like old the, New Brunswick house. You've definitely been to those fraternity parties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ex <laughs> explain that to me. What's that whole thing about? It's just uh, just to make it easier to to go to the bathroom. Like. No, stop it. <laughs> what was it? Was it really about like there, there had to be something that happened yeah, in, like the '60s or something? Exactly. Right? It's uh most more than likely what it is is somebody installed a toilet down there without the township knowing, without the township's permission. Um, and as long as you don't put walls around it, it's not really a bathroom. The township might tell you to remove the toilet, and sometimes what people do is they hide the toilet, they put cardboard boxes on it, or they put stuff in front of stop, it. Stop, stop. You're telling me this is like yeah, men happens. in the 60s were like, I don't wanna I don't wanna go number two around my wife, so I'm gonna run down to the basement. Yeah, people do it all the time. People had uh, excess funds and they're like, hey, I can just put a toilet down here, boom, done. Or they want to rent out their basement. I, I always thought it was just like one of those things where you put the toilet there, and then the township will well like have to give you the permit to turn it into a bathroom later. No, not always. Uh, sometimes they tell you to take it down, and a lot of times they do. So it depends, because if it's not up to code, and most of these are not up to code, 
Um, oh, yeah. Figure. There's usually no sewer pump installed. Yeah. It's just usually a toilet that's on a pedestal, especially a little bit higher up. So that what? way the water flows down. And where does the water go? It uh, goes into your main sewer pipe. Oh, so, that, so they have yeah, to have done that, that plumbing. Yeah, that's, why, that it's all, that's why it's usually on a pedestal. So that way the water goes down. If you go to any of the new construction or the houses that it's built properly, it's all on ground level in the basement, which is which is the way it should be. Because what they have is they have a sewer pump next to the bathroom. What that sewer pump does is once you use that bathroom, it takes your water and pumps it up to your sewer line, which a lot of these houses, the older ones where it's just a toilet, they don't have. Interesting. Because they're taking the cheapest way of like, hey, how do I add a toilet here? You add it above the sewer line, and that's why it's on a pedestal. So have you seen a lot of, um, like the solar became big, right, mm -hmm. in the past couple of years. Have you seen a lot of homes where buyers are confused by like the amount of like integration that people have done with solar or like the Tesla supercharger mm -hmm. in, in the garage or anything like that? Yeah, so the solar is definitely becoming huge. Um, and a lot of buyers do like solar. I've always been one of those people that does not like solar. And my reasoning is nothing to do with green energy. It's more so because solar makes holes on your roof. And no matter how good they do to seal up the holes, you're nonetheless still making holes on your roof. So I just don't like the concept of solar on my roof. It's a, if, it's, if I have a solar plant next to my house, like further in the backyard, if I had a big enough lot, that I'm completely okay with. They had those in Plainsboro, man. Yeah, the yeah. huge, huge lots there, yeah. yeah. I sold a house there, uh, uh, or actually it was in Somerset, but yeah, it was uh, like eight panels like way out there, and I was like, this is nice. Like It's not on the house. Mm -hmm. And also to me, it's a bit of an eyesore solar. I know it's supposed to be more energy efficient and all of that, but I'm just not a fan of solar. But uh, a lot of buyers do like solar. So there's two ways you can actually get solar. One is you can pay for those panels, right? That's a more expensive way. Um, once you pay for the panels, you get the solar that's, uh, or the energy that's created. It's called Renewable Energy Certificates, RECs. So you get those RECs that's uh, generated from the solar panels, and you can sell those RECs for about a thousand bucks per pop. So it's actually a good way of actually generating income. But the more common way people do solar is they do leases, and these leases are absolutely terrible for selling purposes because what that means is the new owner has to automatically inherit the lease that you've signed up for. And these leases are for 25 years or 30 years old. Um, they're they're long-term leases, and if you are selling your house, you have to make sure that the new person buying it is okay with the lease that you've signed in place. Wait a second. You're saying that if you buy a house with like solar panels on the roof and you don't want them there, there's a good chance you can't even take them off. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's a huge Whoa. legal battle. Yeah. I do Unless, not know if about you, if that. You, if there's a solar company that owns it, they'll charge you money to remove those solar panels. So it's a huge thing. It's like, hey, does the buyer pay for it? Does the seller pay for it? It becomes a nightmare. Um, so as long no as the buyer's idea. okay with it, and oftentimes they're not because they're like, hey, why am I going to pay X amount of money on this lease? I don't want this. Um, so that's why it's always advisable. If you want solar, try to buy it. But of course, it's not the cheapest. So. Oh, man. I guess that's just ugh, what you don't know, you don't know, man. When it comes to real estate and all that stuff. I like stuff. that. I like that. And that's the same thing with houses, right? Like a house could be pretty. It could be beautiful. It's a, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the saying goes? Uh, uh, the pig is paint. Uh, Lipstick on a pig, right? Oh, lipstick on a pig. Lipstick on a pig, yeah. You see that all the time. These investors come in, they buy a house, they paint the walls, do new flooring, add recessed lights, change the kitchen, and boom, done. Um, but what you don't know, you don't know. Like, you don't know if the plumbing's been updated. You don't know if the electrical's been updated. You don't know, you don't know the quality. You don't know the sewer. Going back to the sewer scope, right? Like, yeah. you don't know the quality and the integrity of the sewer line. So you really need to do your due diligence as a buyer to make sure you're buying the house. Um, and, uh, and that's actually goes back to one of the reasons why I love doing real estate because you get to work with different types of buyers, right? I work with younger folks that care about the color of the cabinets, the layout, the color of the flooring. Um, and then I work with the different generation where they care about the proximity of the dishwasher to the sink. And I never even realized that people think about a house this way and every buyer is different and I get to learn so much from it. Um, and it's just interesting because every buyer is probably making one of the most expensive purchases of their lifetime. And I'm there just to help them and to guide them into making sure it's it's the right decision for them. And that's one of the reasons why I love it. Uh, I don't view it, as a, view it as a transaction. I'm there to be your trusted advisor. And they've put a lot of trust in me, right? They're, they're not going out there and buying a t-shirt. They're buying a house that's probably the most expensive thing that they've bought to date. So Kush, how many agents do you know? Uh, I know, uh, I don't know the exact number, but definitely a good amount. Uh, I'd say agents that I'm friends with, maybe like 10, 15, and then agents that I know probably up in the hundreds. So why do you think more agents don't do podcasts? 
That is a good question. They really should. This is actually a fantastic opportunity for them to showcase themselves. Like this wasn't that bad. I know yeah. you you might have been a little bit nervous before oh, it happened. Oh, very nervous. It's one of the reasons we opened the studio, right? Yep. I wanted to give an opportunity for my friends to hop on the podcast yep. and get, an under, get get like a little bit of experience yeah. with this. But no remix has a show. A remix has a remix. Yeah, they do. Re- remix <laughs> has a show that, of what they do. It's that DJ in me. You know, I got headphones <laughs> got on, it. so I was like, okay. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's just it's a cool opportunity for me to get guys from New Jersey a chance to, to hop in here. And then, you know, the question I ask at the end of this show, whenever I get someone on here, is like, would you want to do more podcasts? Yeah, this is actually awesome. Uh, I'd love to showcase a little bit more of what I'm working on, uh, some of my recent deals, some of my new listings that are coming up. This is awesome, so. What I always thought would have been awesome is like, before and after with a client. Oh. Right before that, they actually bought the house yeah. and then afterwards talking about it again. that's next level genius. I just, I think that would be so great for content. Yeah. To like have the before and after the part one of like starting the search and then yep. like part two, six months later, they're it's like, like we, we finally found Kushal, the house. can't find us a house. <laughs> <laughs> And then by oh, Monday, he's like, hey, we love Kushal. He found us the house. <laughs> I mean, it's one of those things where it's, they talk about in entrepreneurship that like the journey is more important than the destination, right? It's because mm-hmm. who you're becoming throughout the journey is really that thing that you're gaining throughout this whole process. Mm-hmm. I'm sure it's the same with getting a home, right? The, you know, we have this quote in the fraternity, right? The harder the, um, the obstacle that you're dealing with, the more glorious that the, the result's going to be, right? When you get to that triumphant point mm-hmm. of getting to the finish line. And... I mean, I haven't owned a home directly yet, and that's a whole different, you know, podcast for it's why coming. that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. But uh, I know it's going to be great when it finally does happen. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, uh, buyers that have gone through a lot, they actually do enjoy it a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to give one example of a buyer that was under contract for, I want to say, a year and a half, right, which is not normal by any means. Uh, to put into perspective, most closings happen within 30 days to 60 days. That's how long you're under contract in, and then you buy the house. Um, I had a buyer that was buying a short sale house. It was in Somerset, a beautiful house at a fantastic price point. But what a short sale is, is it's not just the seller selling it. The seller has not been up to date on their payments and they're underwater. So they are working together with their bank to sell the house. So you essentially have a seller, you have the seller's bank, then you have the buyer and the buyer's bank, right? So you have all these different parties and banks are probably the least response, the seller's bank rather, are the least responsive people. So you can ask them a question and you don't get any answer. And it just becomes a frustrating situation all around because the buyers are asking me like, hey, do you know what's going on with the closing? I'm reaching out to their agent. Their agent is reaching out to the seller. The seller is reaching out to the bank and boom, no response. So we were under contract for a year and a half and we did not want to lose this house. Um, The price actually went up on them because the way the bank does it is they base it on the appraisal value. And of course, in a year and a half, the appraisal value went up, which absolutely sucked for my buyers. But luckily, we were still still able to get it way under market value. Um, but I still remember the day of closing. It's like we all like were like I never thought I was going to see them again. I was like, this actually happened, and they were the most happy, happiest buyers. And still to that day, like I remember the the look on her daughter's face, like she's like, wow, this is our house. Um, and then uh, I visited their house recently, and they've completely changed it up, and they've built so much equity. Um, to put some numbers around it, I think they bought it around six hundred and thirty thousand dollars or so, and that house right, and they've definitely added like seventy thousand or so plus to it. But that house right now is easily nine hundred thousand plus. Wow! And even when they bought it, even if they didn't add anything to it, that house was worth at least seven fifty to eight hundred. Like they got a fantastic deal, but it was worth it. But they were also under contract for a year and a half, and with that comes challenges, right? Like, what do they tell their landlord? Like, because their landlord wants to know if they're renewing their lease. And they're like, hey, we, we don't we don't really know what answer to give him. Um, so it, it and then oh, also in this entire process, they had a baby. So they, oh man, yeah. When I started working with them, it was it was one child, and by the time we got to closing, it was one child plus a baby. So uh, they went through a lot, but they were troopers, and uh, I'm glad they stuck with it because uh, they got a fantastic house. Dude, thanks for hopping on the podcast. I'm so glad we got a yeah, chance to introduce. If people want to follow you, uh, what are yeah, your handles? Uh, How does all that work? Yeah, uh, handles are at Agent Kush NJ on Instagram. That's the best way. Or Kushal Shah NJ Realtor on Facebook. But yeah, super excited to be here. And this was awesome. Thanks, man. Yeah. All right, guys. You. We'll catch you guys on the next episode.